All right, welcome into First and Pod, one of our biggest shows of the year. You know the drill. Subscribe, rate, review. Give us five stars. Tell a friend. We want to keep growing this thing in the offseason to impress our bosses and make them pay us more. So we are going to do a mock draft. I will be in Detroit for the Caleb Williams Bears coronation pony. I'm going to do the NFC teams. You're going to do the AFC teams. We'll try to limit the banter so this thing isn't 17 hours. But we've decided that we will do no trades because NFC teams would have to trade with AFC teams and the podcast would take forever. But I do think we can note in the analysis that I think this is a trade-up candidate or this is a trade-down candidate when we ultimately make the pick. Does that sound good? Yeah, there's pressure points in this draft for sure. And so we'll reference those and say, hey, this is what we're doing if the team keeps the pick. But they're obviously in contention to want to move down or move up when they're on the clock. So the okay. easiest thing, I don't know how much analysis is necessary for your Bears uh, to take Caleb Williams with the number one overall pick. Do we have a sounder or a sound effect like they do on ESPN? That's one of the reasons I prefer the ESPN coverage over NFL Network is that they have the do 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 And I've been hearing that noise. For 25 years? No, we do not. The Bears yeah. will be taking Caleb Williams. They controversially did not bring in Jaden Daniels, Drake May, or J.J. McCarthy for the prolonged one-on-one -on -one workout. So they, they better be right. All, they attended all the pro days. They did the combine interviews. They did all of their film work, and they determined that the gap in the film between Caleb and everyone else was so wide that they did not need to do the deep dive in-person interview with any of the other quarterback prospects. I crushed them for this when they didn't bring in Deshaun Watson uh, and they only did the five hour full day interview with Trubisky and Mahomes. Their explanation was, was that Watson was not of the caliber of those two guys. They didn't have the number one pick that year. They had the third pick. They knew Miles Garrett was going one. So they knew they would either get Trubisky or Mahomes they decided they needed to trade up for Mitch. This time, different regime. They say, it's Caleb Williams and nobody else, and I'm fine with it. But like you said, they better be right. And I think, and this is just the conspiracy theorist in me, the deep state thinker that I am, as you know, uh, that why do something to potentially alienate a guy in a time when there's so much player empowerment out there let him know that he is the apple of their eye and that you're not really even flirting with or courting with other people to make him feel even better about the Bears and not flirt with or think about Washington or anything else or pulling in Eli Manning. So I think that that's likely part of it, not a big part, but maybe a small consideration. And I think instantly now that this is a done deal, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I do want to get this out there. Shane Waldron now becomes one of the most important humans in the entire NFL. They kept Matt Eberflus. They brought in a quarterback that had success uh, uh, with the reclamation project, Geno Smith. This is a golden goose opportunity for him to instantly take a quarterback who you've said has the potential to be great from day one and make him that. The head coach is a defensive guy, so he will give Waldron a lot of leeway when it comes to the offense and the decision-making and the play calling. And there are probably head coaches in the NFL who, if you were ranking like how much they mean to the league or their influence or power, it does not match what Waldron now has in getting Caleb Williams uh, in year one, Danny. I know you're big on this. He is far more important to the Bears than their head coaches, what he's able to do with Caleb Williams in year one and beyond. No question. I've got a I do have a question already for you on how we're going to do this mock draft, though. Is this what we think the team will do or what they should do? No, I think this is what we think the teams will do. We're doing that. We're, we're predicting for the teams. We are predicting for the teams. We're going for accuracy here. Okay. Well, then I will take Jaden Daniels, but I do not agree with the pick. Ooh, and by the way. Are you aware of what's happening? You are so big on this stuff, especially with presidential elections after talking to your wife, Stephanie, at Nick Wright's wedding. You are very big on what the betting markets are forecasting. Have you seen in the last 24 hours what has gone on with the number two pick? 
No. Thursday night at the time of this taping, Drake May is now even with Jaden Daniels. They're both minus 110. Then I'm changing the pick. I oh. hadn't seen that because that was what I was going to say. It should be Drake May. I'm changing oh. the pick. Well, then Spence changed the graphic here. The betting markets are minus 110, minus 110 for both players. Okay. I did not see that. I apologize. I've been very busy promoting Pipeline of the Pros. I, Which, by the way, this pick is sponsored by Pipeline to the Pros. People on YouTube can see this. Jeff Van Gundy says, I hope you enjoy this book as much as I love my time at Nazareth University and my D3 basketball experience. Continue. Thank you. Listen, I think that Drake May is the type of quarterback that you need to draft when there are question marks about the quarterbacks. There's obviously question marks about Jaden Daniels. There are question marks about J.J. McCarthy. There are question marks about Drake May. But who has the most raw, natural talent? It It's the dude who can throw the ball over the mountain. Drake May is a crazy good athlete. He's 6'4", and he's got a howitzer for an arm. It's a moldable piece of clay. You can turn that guy into Justin Herbert or Josh Allen if you've got patience and good coaching. He is absolutely the next highest ceiling quarterback prospect. I thought that it, we were, it was foregone conclusion on, on mm-hmm. Daniels, but I did not know that about the gambling odds. I like that. I do think J- Drake May will be the next best quarterback in this draft. So Drake May. Uh, Washington did something very dumb. They speed dated these quarterbacks. They went to like a top golf and they had all four of them there at one time. And they didn't yeah. do them individually. And they're getting ripped to shreds by it. Uh, Mike Florio posted a video about it. And who commented on it and complained about it? Daniel's agent posted something about that. And so that is fueled speculation that the pick will be May. I think that that will ultimately, like you, we're going to get we're an echo chamber on this. I think that May is the better prospect, so I'm happy that my – see, I was – totally makes sense. You are so big right now. The names in the basketball industry that are tweeting about you and your book, which, number one on Amazon, people. I mean, there's a gambling book by – what's the guy's name? Billy Waters, Billy Walters. Walters, yeah. That has been very popular for a very long time, and you surpassed that book. So a golf clap. Thank you, sir. For you. Thank you. Yeah, you and Ben Kaplan. Successful launch. Thank you. Yes. And Um, I would have had anxiety about the signing that you did and getting worried about how many people showed up and if people were going to say mean things. So I give you so much credit for putting yourself out there with that event, by the way. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. All right. So now I'm on the clock for the first time with New England. I got to take Daniels then. And so we'll have three quarterbacks, one, two, three. Um, I wonder how they'll feel about this because my opinion is that their plan all along was to draft Drake May and then bring him along slowly with Jacoby Brissett as the starting quarterback. I think that changes things with a, with, by going with Daniels. Not that Brissett is someone that you're like, oh my God, we're gonna we we need to play him. Um, I think he'll go into a backup role and Daniels will start day one. Because of his age, he's in his mid-20s. So I think he'll get that opportunity. We're going to find out, chicken or the egg here. Because with Ohio State, I had questions about Stroud because of how good his receivers were, Marvin Harrison Jr. and the like. And if it was just a system offense like it had been with past Ohio State quarterbacks. Uh, Daniels was the Heisman. The year before that, he was average. The year before that, he wasn't even good. He had 10 touchdowns to 10 interceptions. Uh, and then he blew up this season and got, ended up in New York with the most prestigious trophy in college sports. So I think as a one-hit wonder, he will be the pick here. Uh, there's some speculation about McCarthy going two or three. Uh, I think it'll be Daniels, and New England will uh, immediately play him. But I think the, Which is a the, mistake. Yes, I think the Patriots are tracking right now as one of the worst organizations in sports post, post Tom Brady. And what is Bob Bob Kraft here? Hilarious, the pettiness that's going on, trying to undermine Bill Belichick's career. This article that went out on ESPN and Belichick now 
on McAfee's show for the draft analysts, there is literally not a human being I would I would want to hear less from on the draft when all of his draft picks have been so bad. Whatever he says on that draft night show, I'm going to think the opposite. And then the funniest thing about it, Danny, is I don't know if you saw his appearance on McAfee. He was referred to as eight-time Super Bowl champion. The graphic said eight. He wants to make sure, this was not by mistake or coincidence, that he's counting those giant defensive coordinator Super Bowls because he wants to have more than Tom Brady. That's how personal it is between these two guys. No other assistant coach gets credit for rings, but he wants those to count so he looks better than Brady. Hilarious what's going on with these two guys post their time together in New England. Ego is unbelievable. Um, I would not play Jaden Daniels. I would not play whatever quarterback New England picks for a long, long time. Uh, to figure out They're just, that roster is just so barren of talent. I think you're setting him up for failure. But he's 24. I no, I understand that, but you have nothing on the roster. Uh, by the way, we're pacing for a hour and 50 minute podcast at this point, so we need to pick it up a little bit. Uh, Arizona is obviously a trade down candidate because of how many needs they they have, and if someone really is going to say like if there's really going to be a bidding war for JJ McCarthy, they're in a very good spot. If somehow the Giants were interested uh, and they could trade down only to six and not have to trade down all the way to like 11 or something uh, with Minnesota, I think they would prefer to do that so they could still get a blue chip player. But assuming no trades, uh, they lost Hollywood Brown, receivers their biggest need, Kyler is there, Kyler is under contract. This is a very easy pick if they don't trade out of it. Marvin Harrison Jr. Yeah. And I love him. His dad went to our alma mater. And for two years, we've looked at him as the best wide receiver in college football. Yeah, I, I get the neighbors thing because of the speed. I love Adunze. We've talked about it. We'll talk about these guys as we go. But I just, uh, I don't, if Arizona stays at four, I don't see them taking anyone else. I'm on the clock at five with the Chargers. I'm not going to take J.J. McCarthy, even though Harbaugh calls him the best quarterback in the draft. Uh, I'm going to take Malik Neighbors here. They caught Mike Williams. They traded Keenan Allen to your Bears. Neighbors, this is everything you need to know about this guy in a nutshell. Most catches in LSU history. And think about the wide receivers that have come through there. Jefferson, Beckham, Chase. He is the guy with the most catches in that school's history. And his combine scores and pro day scores are like a hybrid of those great receivers. Now you pair him with Herbert, Herbert with an offensive coach like Harbaugh. He should be a monster. I think Hall of Fame caliber wide receiver in that spot. He will instantly become one of the most popular players in the NFL. His jersey will fly off shelves. He'll be a fantasy football monster for years to come. Neighbors to the Chargers at five. Yeah, I agree. I think that's a pretty obvious uh, pick in that spot. The I have nothing to add. The uh, The Giants at six. What are I you doing in, here now, buddy? Well, so right. I, I think in this scenario, they're actually thrilled. And J.J. McCarthy is off the board. I would be tempted to take Udunze personally and upgrade over Darius Slayton. And I don't love J.J. McCarthy, but I think that that's the type of guy that they would say he can be the face of the franchise. He could handle New York and they would build around him and they would take the pedigree and what Harbaugh said and they would sell it in that city. I don't think they could sell Joe Alt. He's maybe the most commonly mocked guy there. I think that that pick would get booed. Obviously, guys get booed in New York all the time, and it ends up being fine. It's a fleeting moment. Uh, Odunze would be popular. Alt would be unpopular. But in this scenario, I think they take J.J. McCarthy, and they're thrilled about it. So what becomes of Daniel Jones? He's the most expensive lame duck in football history. Yeah, but it's only one more year. Right? D Daniel Jones is not terrible to get out of next year. Is that noise I'm, I'm hearing? You're you pounding on your keyboard yeah. to get all the details yeah. here quickly yes, for everyone. Is. Thank you for that. Yeah, potential out 2025. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this year he is a forty-seven million dollar, forty-eight million dollar cap hit. It would have been a sixty-nine million dollar dead cap hit. So yeah, Daniel Jones. And and what that guarantees is that it's a disaster twenty twenty four season for the Giants. But they're because, fine with that. Yeah, because that, but that like that dynamic in New York will be absolutely destructive. And I think from a team standpoint, it'll cannibalize them that they have this controversy hanging over them. And I could even see Dable getting fired um, because of the complete chaos that this will create, in my opinion. Unless they, unless they just com- unless they just abandon Jones right from the very beginning and they make McCarthy their quarterback from day one. I just think it's going to get very messy there. And I'm not sure. I, I actually no, I don't think the organization's built for that, to be honest with you. Um, and I don't think it's worth it. I'll just go on the record as saying that. I would take a Dunze here. I don't think it's worth it to create this kind of like here is one of the highest paid quarterbacks. What, why are you making that face? One of the well, highest. I don't paid- think that Daniel. I don't think that Daniel Jones for one year is worth passing on a quarterback if you love him to be your franchise guy. Who loves him? We just talked about this. We've talked about this on the podcast before. Why is JJ like, McCarthy? Like if they, dude, the NFL clearly loves him. Jim Harbaugh clearly loves him. Every NFL analyst says that he is in play for the third pick in the draft. So there's Great. there's not, there's not Jim a Harbaugh loves Blake Corum. He ain't going to be a first round pick. I mean, who cares what Jim Harbaugh thinks? He's biased. He should be. He won a national championship with the. No, Kansas. I understand. My, my 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 point is is that there is not a consensus on Daniels, May, and McCarthy. I bet you thirty two teams have that two through four in a lot of their, a lot of teams would have each guy in the two spot, the three spot, and the four spot. So the Giants getting one of those guys at six, presuming that they like him, I, I think that they would make the pick. But keep I'd going. rather get the wide receiver that has potential greatness written all over him in a Dunze. And if Daniel Jones stinks with that player, then you go into the draft next year or the free agent quarterback carousel or trade market, then do what you're describing. But I don't the bottom line is I don't disagree that I think it could happen. I think it in, in this scenario, it's likely to happen if he's still on the board. All right, seven for me is Tennessee. They're taking Joe Alt with this pick. Uh, This is like one of the worst kept secrets, in my opinion, in the entire draft, that he'll be the first offensive lineman among uh, among the many who comes off the board. Uh, They took Skaronsky last year from from Northwestern right down the road from you, but he's got very, very short arms, and they had to make him a guard. They'll take all – I have big-time reservations about how great he can be. I think he'll be solid. Uh, I don't think, you know, that we've seen Eric Fishers and Luke Jokels and guys like that go early in draft. So it's not like these are all slam dunks. I think he'll have a good career, but not a great career. And they'll regret this pick when it's all said and done. Atlanta at eight. Ooh. How we how we set it up, which is a majority consensus opinion that the top seven picks are all offense. It'd be only the second time in the Super Bowl era that there was no defensive player taken in the top seven picks. The other time was 2021. Atlanta has taken Kyle Pitts, Drake London, and Bijan Robinson. I do not think they would take offensive line in this spot. They obviously would not take quarterback. So they get their top defensive player. Go ahead. I would not say it's obvious that they wouldn't take quarterback. Two people... Baldy came on our podcast last week and brought Pinnock's up, and I thought that that was ridiculous. I ran it by somebody who I who has given me. Remember last year I gave you the Bijan Robinson pick with Atlanta. Did not rule that out, Penix. And then you saw Jonathan Jones from CBS who replaced Locke and Fora, and his one and only mock. He had Penix going there at eight two. So I'm not telling you to predict that. And when Baldy said that on the podcast with us last week, I thought it was ridiculous. But I checked it with people, and they actually think it is possible, which makes no sense to me given the amount of money they just committed to Kirk Cousins, why you would want to use a top 10 pick yeah, on another that would developmental be, quarterback. That would be completely insane. That would be completely insane. Their defense was good. Their offensive skill position guys are good. Like – now, if you want to say draft an offensive lineman who's got versatility to protect your 36-year-old quarterback coming off of an Achilles, I can listen to that argument. But I think top defensive player on the board 
get Dallas Turner, put him on turf, help take that defense and keep them in the top 10 defensively. Dallas Turner's off the board. All right. I think it's, I think it's a, just a so, so pick. I've never in my life when it comes to defensive players, especially from big football factories like Alabama and Georgia, I've never seen less effusive praise for a player than Dallas Turner. It's like everyone says he's good, but there's like no over the top commentary or analysis of him whatsoever. It's crazy. It's just that he's solid. It's just that he's good enough against the run, good enough against the pass, good enough motor, very high floor, very good work ethic. Like, it's a safe pick. He's not going to bust. He's not going to be a superstar. But so, but it's a, it's a premium position and a position that they're lacking at significantly. Uh, this pick to, for me would be very easy. Rome Odunze. My God, would that be one of the greatest? That would be the Bengals wide receiver core all over again with these three guys if this happens. If, if this pick comes in, I will immediately bet the over on the Bears this season if Adunze actually drops them at nine. And I hope you do the same thing. I don't know what FanDuel will max me out at, but it will be conservatively a three-figure bet and potentially a four-figure bet if he actually goes there. Well, I would hope it would be a at least a $100 bet. Yeah. Um, I said three-figure to four-figure. Maybe it's a th- <laughs> maybe it's in the thousands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Odunze is the dream scenario. Oh I mean, my god, would this be amazing for you guys? I'd be so jealous if this happens. It would be, it would be really, really, really incredible. Um, and you'll be there for it. I will be there for it. I will be in Detroit doing the show. There's offensive line is popular. Trading down is popular. It, it, it's just sickening. Like, stop playing money ball. Get blue chip players. Get a blue chip player to t- pit pair with your blue chip quarterback. If they trade down and take a defensive player, I might cry on the air. Just like people are like, oh. You have Caleb Williams that night. There will be no crying after you yeah, get I know. the I transcendent know. quarterback. My prediction is Odunze will be gone, and they're going to end up with someone like Jared Verse or the edge rusher from uh, UCLA or whatever. Uh, Latu. I, yeah. I, think, I think if it goes if, if, it, if it goes offensive players one through eight, I actually think they would take Byron Murphy as the top, as the top defensive player. I think I think remember we talked. I said that two weeks ago to bet that it's the yeah. ninth pick. Yeah, I think, I, think, right I think Byron Murphy is a. I, I think Byron Murphy and uh, Fatano, the the kid from Washington, as a tackle, is a. Um, those are the those are like the other players. But if Odunze is there, I think you sprint in with the pick. Okay, ten to me. I'm going to take Brock Bowers. To the Jets. Um, I think they'd be thrilled with this. Wow. I still can't shake the fact that when I see or when I saw him at the Super Bowl, he looked like he did your taxes when he was next to Rob Gronkowski. It looked like he played a completely different sport, how physically unimpressive he looked. He is not going to be your traditional tight end. He's going to be more like a big slot receiver. It's going to be reminiscent of what Dalton Kincaid was for the Bills in the second half of the season. It's incumbent on Nate Hackett and Aaron Rodgers to utilize him correctly from day one. I don't think he's a slam dunk. I think he's got to be in the right offense, and they've got to utilize him correctly with the right quarterback. And so I think they'll take the shot here, give Aaron another weapon. He'll love that because Green Bay would never do that for him. But I'm not – I think this is – I think this sounds like the right pick, but the practical application of it, I still have to see in order to believe it's going to go off swimmingly. I think I would take Fatano, the tackle from Washington with the crazy athleticism and just say, you've got a 40 something year old quarterback coming off of an Achilles injury, protect the franchise and figure if Aaron Rodgers is healthy, he can make chicken salad out of chicken bleep with weapons. You got and Smith he- and Moses. You can get by for a year at tackle with those two guys, I think. They're, what, 33 and 34 years old? Well, you watch Jason Peters play tackle. The guy would eat pork rinds all offseason, then block fine. Yeah. So, okay, I mean, look, they, they, if, they, if you think that they're staying healthy in their mid-30s at tackle, okay. That's fine. I I would I would I would protect Aaron Rodgers. Eleven to the Jets is hard for you now that McCarthy is gone and we weren't allowing for them to trade up. So I'm very intrigued by what you're going to do. Eleven with to here. the Vikings. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, 11 to the Vikings is tough, but we will get into that with First and Pod back after this. All right, welcome back in First and Pod, Danny Parkins, Andrew Filipponi. Um, Yeah, this is a brutal, brutal spot because... And by the way, this pick and this segment of the draft is sponsored by Pipeline to the Pros. By Danny Parkland, by Danny Parkins and Ben Kaplan. Adrian Wojnar- Wojnarowski says, Woj, as he's commonly called. Ben Kaplan and Danny Parkins do a masterful job of unearthing the remarkable stories and paths out of the outposts of Division Three basketball and into the power corridors of the NBA. What a terrific read! Exclamation point. He read it, man. He, that the whoa, whoa, uh, pa- Jeff Passan connected me with him, and I uh, love Jeff. By the way, I hope you keep in contact with him. I hope he's all right after that tree fell on him. Yeah, we keep in touch. Yeah, okay, he's good. and he's he's fine. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm good. I'm good friends with Passan. We were tight in Kansas City. Uh, it's a damn shame that he can't come on my show because of the ESPN Radio competitor here. Uh, he's the absolute greatest. Um, but Woj, man, when Woj said he would check it out and we sent him a manuscript and like a day and a half later, he had read seven chapters and said that he absolutely loved the book. Oh, that is sick. It was, it was really, really cool. Um, But, and thank you for your, for your plugs. Okay. So obviously Minnesota is trying to trade up. They acquired the extra first round pick. Um, In my mind, they want a quarterback but they also need defensive back help. So if they're staying here and they're not moving around in this draft, I will take uh, Terry and Arnold, the cornerback from Alabama. They need personality. They need swagger. They need moxie. Everyone says that guy's an absolute dog. So they've got nothing at defensive back. So I'll take Terry and Arnold for the Vikings. Uh, Brian Flores would like that pick. I know him decently. I think he'd, he'd be a big fan of that. Um, it's crazy that like, all year we thought Kool-Aid McKinstry was going to be the first Alabama corner. We'd heard his name for such a long time. And by by the end of things, his running mate ends up being the better draft prospect, which is interesting how guys stack up when the season starts and where they are by the time the draft process finishes. So my pick is Denver here. And did you see today on Thursday – that Patton, the GM, and Sean Payton have a bet going where a certain player, they have a number, an over-under pick number. And if the guy who loses the bet who's wrong about where the guy goes in the draft has to shave his head. No, that's yes. amazing. Yes. And we were debating who is the player they're talking about. And my two guys are either Penix or McCarthy is who they have a gentleman's wager over where these guys get picked. I think they're going to take the quarterback that I didn't mention there. I'm going to go with Bo Nix. I think Nix fits. Yep. I think Nix fits the type of quarterback play. And I know we had Taysom Hill, and that was a uh, a project of love for Peyton, and he just had a rich affection for the guy. I think he feels like he can plug and play this guy immediately and win with him. They're vanity projects. I think that 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 there's so much hubris on Peyton's part that he fancies himself like a Kyle Shanahan type. And he's going to go for a quarterback who put up big numbers and is in his 20s and is more accurate than Penix. And I think he feels like he can get him into this offense and play him right away and have uh, production good enough to make them a competitive team. So they stay where they are and they take Knicks with this pick. I mean... They would be s- fine. I, I can't listen. If you if you love a quarterback, I, it's never a bad idea to take him. Their roster is so pathetic, <laughs> and they don't pick again until seventy six. Yep. What what is Bo Nix going to do with that roster? Bo Nix, ready made quarterback. Feels feels to me like this would be the time to just take a safer pick and just get a good player. Whether that's you know the the tackle from Oregon State or JC Latham from Bama, Brian Thomas from LSU, just like get a good player. Um that would that would terrify me if I was a Broncos fan. 
All right, but, so I'm up now with the Raiders. Yes, right? you are, and they need a lot of help. I don't think they'll take a quarterback here. I think they've got um, Minshew, and they've got no Aiden O'Connell. So I think they'll stick with those two here. I don't think they'll take Penix with this pick. I'm looking at their offensive line. You've got a guy named Thayer Munford Jr. at right tackle, who was a seventh round pick two years ago. Yeah. Um, I think that they will draft Fuaga from Oregon State and immediately plug him in there, and he becomes their right tackle, and they're going to look at him like he's their Lane Johnson for the next 10 years. Telesco's the GM there. He was the GM with the Chargers for so long. He gets a lot of credit for building the total roster there. So I think he pairs need also with like what the strength of this draft is. They're very good offensive linemen. We only have one off the board. They also need someone to play tackle. I think that's what they do with this pick. So who did you take? Talese Fuaga from Oregon State. Yep. And just, and yeah, make him the right tackle probably. Yep. Yeah, he's the right tackle. Okay. So New Orleans, I think, in this spot is in a very, very interesting conundrum because they need everything on the offensive line, right? I mean, I mean, the Trevor Penning was a first round pick in what, 21 or 22? I think 22. He, he was in the 22 draft. Yeah, 22 draft. He's been he's been mortifying. Their their right their right tackle is hurt. They lost um, uh, Pete, the guard, right in free agency, or he is leaving. And so they they've got multiple starting jobs open on the offensive line. But I also think that the best player on the board here is Byron Murphy, and they don't have anyone there either. So this uh, this will come down to whether or not they have Olu Fashanu. JC Latham or Byron Murphy as like their top actual graded player, because I think both are equal needs. I personally think that Byron Murphy will be the highest graded player. So I will take Byron Murphy for the, uh, for the saints, but their offensive line is problematic. Yes, it is. A um, little bit surprised by that pick. They're a wild card team, so I know it's hard to kind of predict and get a handle on what they're going to do when there's they, they've been in salary cap hell for so long. I just could see like we we've had a little bit of a run of tackles, and so I could see them being like, okay, am I taking the fourth or fifth offensive lineman, or am I taking the number one defensive lineman? You know, sure. interior defense defensive lineman in the draft, and just just doing it that way. So that I mean that that was the tiebreaker for me, but obviously. You know, Latham would be a good pick. Fashano would be a good pick, but I just, I just got to assume that they're going to go with the higher. The, but I mean, again, like you said, it's, it's very tough. All right, so I'm on the board with the Colts. I think the Colts, they need a tight end, but I don't think Ballard is the type to move up to get Bowers. So I'll just make that point that I think that that's a possibility. I don't think they'd move up seven or eight spots. Maybe they'd move up a couple. If he slides, so I would just keep an eye on them as a Bowers team. Jelani Woods right now is their starting is their starting tight end. It's a major area of weakness for them. They didn't do anything in free agency to address it. Um, they're in a division with CJ Stroud. And so they need secondary help. You've got more in the nickel. Brents, who was a rookie last year. Um, had a decent year. He's not a number one corner, though. You need a number one corner in a division with Stroud and Lawrence. And I think that this pick will be Mitchell from Toledo. I believe that he has a chance to be the best defense, the best defensive player in this draft. My personal pick is Chop Robinson on that. But the fact that this guy from Toledo is thought this highly of. He's, it's a different position, but it reminds me of Khalil Mack. He stayed there in the Mack. He didn't take the NIL money or go to a bigger school. He absolutely shut down the very best wide receivers who were at the Senior Bowl. He had the coaches, uh, their mouths were agape watching him dominate. He was one of the best players there, so he proved that he could get it done. He skyrocketed up boards. I think he goes to Indianapolis because they need a shutdown number one corner 
in a division with very good young quarterback quarterbacks. I they definitely do need a defensive back. You made the case very very well, but they're also so heavily invested in Anthony Richardson being good. I think Brian Thomas Jr. there would have been really tough to pass up for me. Put it put put that guy with his size and speed combination with Anthony Richardson on a fast track in Indy. That would be very, very difficult for me. I think it's so deep at wide receiver, they'll get a guy on day two. That's my prediction. Well, no, I mean, yeah, they they, they will have to if they if they pass on one there. Um, all right. So Seattle, like this is very similar. It's like they would be thrilled that at 14, I took Byron Murphy and left more tackles for them on on the board. Um, I think they will just say Troy Fatanu. We saw him play at Washington. Let's keep him in the Pacific Northwest. We're th- we're thrilled that that level of athlete is still here for us. Plug and play, easy pick. I think they sprint this to the podium if it breaks this way. I think this is one of the easiest picks that I've had to make. I'm not sure where he'll play. I mean, they've got young tackles. They need help inside on their offensive line. I could see this guy playing guard. Now he played left tackle his entire career at Washington. Yeah. But there's a lot of discussion about him swinging inside. And I think, given the state of their offensive line, that might actually happen. Um, But I could could see him getting picked by them regardless of how they feel about their tackles right now. Because they're inside of their – I think this is a center team, by the way, too. That's a possibility with some of the first-round caliber centers that are in the draft. Um, 17 to me is Jacksonville, right? Yeah, they Danny. feel like a trade down team to me. But. They do. They do. Um, I am going to take for them. So when where did Arnold go? Where did you have him getting picked? Uh, him 11, board, 11 right? to Minnesota. 11 to Minnesota. I am going to take another corner here with Jacksonville. And I am going to make it uh, Cooper DeGene. The guy from Iowa? I'm going to take the first white corner since Jason Seahorn. Right here with DeGene. There's a little bit of Kyle Hamilton here too. Where you're hearing about his maneuverability around the defense. uh, Maybe a Mika Fitzpatrick (laughs) as well. This will not happen. Why? They're not taking a white corner at 17. They would trade down. <laughs> I know we're not doing trades, but that, that would not happen. Why not? Like, they, they, a white corner can't be the 17th pick in the draft. It's not allowed. Well, it hasn't been allowed in the league for about 20 years. I'm just saying it's, it's, that, Shane um, Gillis, it's that Shane Gillis bit. They're, they're extinct. They're like the pandas at the San Diego Zoo. <laughs> Did he actually do a bit on that? Yes. So good. I've gone back and forth on him. I didn't like him initially, but then like someone said, you're not giving him a chance. And I started to watch and listen to more of it. And I've liked it. What I can't get wrap my head around is the Robinson guy. I don't find any of his stuff funny whatsoever. Who? What's his name? Tim Robinson. Oh, ne- oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. He yeah. doesn't do it for me, and I yeah, want no, to. Yeah. Shane, Shane Gill. No, I know who you're talking about. Shane, Shane Gillis is is very, very funny. Do you know um, who I'm talking about? Yes, I do. And uh, everybody thinks he's hysterical, and I feel like um, an outcast for not liking him. But I just got to be completely honest that he just does not make me laugh. So, Tim Robinson. Tim Robinson. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, I'm gonna take uh, Cooper DeGene here. And this is going to be another one of these picks, by the way, where you ridicule me and say this has no chance of happening. This is a waste of time. And then it happens and you have to come on the podcast next oh. week while you're half in the bag in Detroit. Who knows what you're, where you're drinking and going out in Detroit late at night. We've got uh, our maybe, places. Maybe Spencer can give you a couple of recommendations. Um, and... Well, listen, everybody says Jacksonville needs a corner. I understand. So you took the top corner on the board. They're not taking a white corner at 17. It's just not happening. Go ahead, Cincinnati. Cincinnati's going to take an offensive tackle. 
um, with this pick. And it's interesting because they have so Orlando taking, Brown. Taking Fashano? Well, so you've got Brown. And Brown's played right tackle too, but remember how pissed off it made him to play right tackle? So I happen to know, I've got a lot of information on Fashanu because obviously Penn State's very close to where I am and there's more Penn State alums in the county that I live in than anywhere in America. This kid, from a professional standpoint, made a big mistake. He would have been the number one tackle picked in last year's draft. Um, But his parents are both teachers. He's got an educational background. Penn State's a very good public school. He wanted to get his diploma and go back and go to college for one more year. And it cost him because he's now sliding. He's a great pass blocker. He is not a good run blocker. That's what everyone says about him. That's the book on this guy. And so given Orlando Brown's situation, I think they're going to take J.C. Latham with this pick. I think Latham has been at Alabama for now two years of tape, has been a very good offensive tackle on the right side. And I don't think that the Bengals will mess with that. I don't think they'll try to turn Fashano into a right tackle when he hasn't played there. And I don't think they're going to ask Brown to move back there. So I think they'll do the logical thing and take the guy who from the maybe on tape is the best right tackle in the draft. I think Burrow would love this pick. Got to do everything you can to keep him upright. With the 19th pick in the first in pod subscribe rate and review mock draft. The LA Rams select. Again, they're going to keep it local. They will take. They're not going to take an Aaron Donald replacement. They're going to take Laitu Latu, defensive end, edge rusher, UCLA. The guy has excellent film. He's played two years <laughs> being healthy. I legitimately don't understand why people keep bringing up the failed medical. He's played two full seasons of football since the injury. Unless you're telling me that he's one hit away from his career being (coughs) over, then okay, fine. But that's not what people are saying. They're like, he failed a physical. Yeah. And then another doctor cleared him and has been proven correct. Obviously, we don't have access to the medicals, but this guy has played two full seasons of productive football since he had the injury. So I, if if he's one bad hit away from his career being over, then he should go undrafted. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't seem to be the case. He is a very talented player at a premium position who's been productive for two full seasons in college football. I think the Rams would be thrilled if he's there at 19. Over Newton and Verse. I would take either one of those guys over Verse, him. Ver- Verse, man, I will admit, I, I will not be drafting Verse for an NFC team. He He's older than everybody. Okay. That just seems like, okay, congrats, man. You're 24 years old. You're stronger than a 19-year-old tackle. I would have I would have a serious bias against that guy. Your Pittsburgh Steelers are on the clock, and I'm guessing they're pretty thrilled with how this has gone. Right, because every center is out there. And so are the offensive tackles. So this brings up. Well, there are a lot of tackles are off the board, but go ahead. Well, uh, Mims is still out there. And you've got all three centers. Yeah, Mims and Fashano. So this comes down to me. A debate in that room is going to take place on positional value versus need. And also like scarcity of the position in the draft. So if you don't take Mims here, the tackles fall way off. And what are you going to do? You're going to, if you move Broderick Jones to left tackle, you're going to have scrubs at right tackle. If you keep Jones at right tackle, you're going to take a, what's the um, baseball term? Um, Like above, you're going to have a replacement level left tackle in in Dan Moore Jr. 
But He's you still been, you, have, you have Mims, and I know you just did the whole rundown on Fashanu, but we no one has drafted Fashanu. They our wouldn't mind. take him. They won't take him. Okay. They won't take him because of the because of the run blocking thing. They did almost no homework on the guy when he's right down the road. It's like they it's like they've already ruled him out. If they do it, it's one of the great smoke screens, and they've really never been a smoke screen organization. They've been such an easy team to predict in the draft the last few years, from Najee to Broderick Jones. Um, but they badly need a center. Um, I'm just not convinced that they like Barton more than the other two guys. I think they could trade back into the early second round to get Frazier, who I know they believe can play from day one. So this is my long-winded way talking about my team of saying, I think they'll take Mims. And I think Tomlin will look at the potential there and say to himself, if this guy had played more than eight games, he'd be a top 10 pick in this draft. He'd be better than all. They would have moved him to left tackle if he had actually stayed healthy and gotten a chance to play. And I think that the the GM, Khan, will make the argument, getting the fifth-year option and having a first-round pick offensive tackle is more valuable to our organization than doing that with a center. Yes, this is the organization that had Pouncey and Mike Webster and Dermani Dawson. But I think here they'll take Mims because they'll feel like they can get the center somewhere else in the draft. And if they have to maneuver around to get him, they'll do that. So you guys took Broderick Jones last year, who was like a pretty toolsy athletic guy, and it didn't work out from day one, didn't play him at day one. Any chance like that's their type and they take Tyler Guyton? From Oklahoma? Has that been talked about? Yes. I think that's possible. Guyton seems like a like a this year Broderick Jones. Like if, if they're gonna have patience. But I think Mims has an even higher ceiling, Danny. I think Mims, if he had played more than a few games, okay, was in the conversation to be the number one tackle that was picked in this year's draft. Okay. Uh it's your it's your team. We'll do one more, then we'll break. Who are you taking for Miami? Well, Miami lost a lot on defense, um, but they've also had Big time departures from their offensive line. Connor Williams was their center towards ACL. I'm going to give them a center here. And this is where I'm going to give them Barton. And here's wow. why I'm giving them Barton. Graham Barton from Duke. He can play. He, he's, he played center his freshman year. And then he played since he's been a left tackle. And so, you know, I don't think he'll play left tackle in the NFL. I think he could play guard. You know, Baldy had you know convinced me and you that he could play guard. He's a six-five center. He's the same side as Creed Humphrey. He gets out in space and runs and blocks better in space than anybody. So I think that they'll take him and he'll be their center for the next eight to nine years. Graham Barton Duke. Okay. I have the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Arizona Cardinals, a couple of NFC teams, uh, as we continue the first in pod mock draft back after this. Welcome back into first in pod, Danny Parkins, Andrew Filipponi. So Philly's on the clock at 22. And everything coming out of Philly is that Cam Jurgens is going to replace Jason Kelsey. And that makes sense to me. But if Powers Johnson is there, <clears throat> do they pass on him? Do they pass on him for a corner because their defense was so bad last year? Suppose that's possible. I guess they're going to go with a veteran there from everything that they do. So their pass defense was so horrendous <laughs> last season. And they lost more in free agency. I guess I'll take Nate Wiggins, the corner. Oh, man. Well, I'll tell you what. There's a chance he ends up being the best lockdown corner in this draft. I don't see him. Last year, Witherspoon was a top 10 pick. He's got no chance of being the complete package. That guy would get his hands dirty, and he would F you up. That guy was an absolute animal. This kid is just so small, and that is the concern. He's 170. I mean, he's the Danny Parkins of corners. You know, hey, buddy, like I'm, one, I'm 150. What? <laughs> yeah, man. Dude, you're like six one and a half, six two. 
Six one. And you weigh one fifty? It's disgusting. But I don't even know if you have great eating habits. I have terrible eating habits. There should be a documentary done on you. <laughs> you are a marvel, my man. I'm just a skeleton. It's not. It's, it's incredible. All of my weight is in my chin. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that, which is such a self-deprecating line. But I know you're also self-conscious about it, so I didn't want to bring it up. I am very self-conscious. Uh, this guy's got speed, though. And so from that perspective, he can cover. But I'm just worried if he can tackle anybody in the NFL, Danny. That's the big concern here. So in this scenario where we don't do trades and Minnesota is on the clock and you took Bo Nix at 12, I think I have to take Michael Penix and just say, thank you very much. And we're having six quarterbacks go in the first round of the draft. They missed out on McCarthy in our draft here because the Giants picked him. Well, that's what I'm saying. They didn't. Yeah. We we're not allowing for trade ups. They were not going to take one of these guys at 11. And they just turned that Houston pick into a project for Kevin O'Connell. And they take Michael Penix and they try to sell it to their fan base as we address our two biggest needs, corner and quarterback. But we did it in a weird order. And this is why this will never happen because there are trades, but Michael Penix Jr. is a Minnesota Vikings uh, Viking with the 23rd pick. Penix reviews and analysis are all over the map, man. I'm, I'm very torn on the guy. I was out on him, but I respect the game he had against Texas. I respect him elevating that program to uh, unforeseen heights. I also, though... Also, I also put credence in not just the injury history and the age, which are big red flags, but there's even now a growing amount of analysis that says his wide receivers were so good, they made all kinds of plays for him and made a quarterback that's not really that accurate look all that much better. That the draft cognoscenti are just not convinced he's accurate enough at the NFL to play big-time football at the NFL level. So. If I had to choose, am I in or am I out on the guy? I would say out. If I had to pick a lane. Yeah, I mean, Penix, I, think you're I, I, I agree. But he, I think in this scenario, Minnesota would be yeah. enticed. Um, so so Dallas is going to take Fashanu here then at 24. And they're going to love this well, pick. And Well, okay. So our draft is dumb because people say that there could be eight receivers taken. And well, they're had, wrong. There's not going to be eight receivers taken. There's not. There's and, it, just and, not. And, and, we, and we've had three go off the board. Like, does does Brian Thomas Jr. not – listen, Dallas has lost, what, five offensive linemen, six offensive linemen? They're taking – if they're, I don't even – if Brian Thomas Jr. is there, they're taking an offensive tackle or an, or a center with this pick, in my opinion. I don't even think it matters. With Lamb really? and with Cooks. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think, this, I think this scenario could actually happen. Um, all right, well because, then I'll take I'll take Olu for you. Oh, I'm I'm ma- my bad. I'm making the pick. I just like completely yeah. jumped hey, in there. Dallas is in the NFC, Tony. Dallas is in the NFC. We've but only they're... been doing this for an hour, and I'm breaking <laughs> our own rules. <laughs> Dallas is a popular team in the NFC. So the... you can do what you want. I mean, if you think Thomas is the pick here, then do that, brother. Well, I understand, but. They need offensive line more than they need receiver. But Jerry Jones has a tendency to take skill position guys who fall. If the fourth wide receiver is on the board at 24, I think they'd be really tempted to take him. And they're not that deep at skill position either. But you could also argue the second best left tackle is still available. Well, I would hope we wouldn't make that argument given that we've had five tackles go off the board. How many of them are left tackles, though? Well, I mean, Alt's a left tackle. Uh, Fatano's a left tackle. They're going to – I mean, and then – That's it. You don't think there's any chance that – what, we've got Latham. Right tackle. Mims. Mims, right tackle. Fuaga, right tackle. Fuaga, for sure, right tackle. Yeah. Yeah. 
And you can argue Fatanu against Fashanu all day. I mean, I don't think that there's a consensus on which one of those guys is better. All right. I will just, I already wrote it on my sheet. So I'll take Olu Fashanu for Dallas at, at 24. Is it my, oh, oh yeah. Now 25 Green Bay. God. So Powers Johnson is still on the board, but I just made that big spiel about receivers. And they drafted Josh and they drafted Myers a few years ago as the center. And I believe they might have picked him ahead of Creed Humphrey, if my memory serves right, from Ohio State. God, they're so they're so young on offense. They're not taking a safety here. I think I would take you took Graham Barton, right? Yeah, for Miami. Mm Mm-hmm. I think I'll take Jackson Powers Johnson and say Josh Myers goes to guard. Okay. I'll take Jackson Powers Johnson. It's weird with him. I felt like when the season ended, everybody thought for sure he was the best center. And I talked to Jeff Schwartz about this. He doesn't get it. He doesn't really understand how Barton has picked up steam and looks like he's the guy that's more in vogue it could all be like BS, but I still think Zach Frazier seems pretty damn good. Yep. I agree with that. I like him a lot. And I'm not just saying that because my wife went to school there and we watch all their games. Okay. So in this scenario, this is another easy pick. Tampa would take Brian Thomas Jr. They need younger skill position talent. I wow. know they need offense. I know they need offensive line help as well, but we've drafted eight offensive linemen at this point in the first. 25 picks right well yeah i think that that could actually happen i don't think that we're like no i'm not saying that i'm I'm not but i'm just saying all fuaga fatanu latham mims barton fashanu powers johnson yeah that's eight offensive linemen in the first 25 picks and only three receivers this would be brian thomas jr learn from mike evans congratulations Excellent landing spot. I think that they would sprint to the podium. And now you got to go back to Arizona, and they've taken Marvin Harrison Jr. already in this draft. Oh my gosh, this is a run of NFC teams. I got a lot of. I got, this is a lot of work. You weren't factoring in to your book promotion this week that you would have to account for a second Arizona Cardinals first round pick. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Um, okay. Arizona. Let me go back. Let me go back to my sheet. Um, all right. Well, so they, what they need, they need edge. Ugh. So Jared verse or chop Robinson. I guess I'll take Jared verse. You said an hour ago that you would not be t- picking Jared. Oh, yeah, I did. I did. Job Robinson. Job Robinson. <laughs> Job Robinson is off the board for the Arizona Cardinals. I'll have a ticket on I'll have a ticket on Robinson to win the NFC rookie of the year in that Gannon defense. Not that I loved Gannon. We obviously killed him and harangued him for what yeah, happened I'll with the Philadelphia Rob- defense. But I think there's a lot of potential there with this guy. I mean, I yeah, see, he, didn't, he didn't play a lot, right? I see Micah Parsons Jr. in him. Uh, he had four sacks. Yes. Right, in yep. 10 games. Oh, nice little run of you having to do the work here. Jaguars, Raiders, Ravens. Let's go. All right. So the Bills got to find the Stephon Diggs replacement here. And so yeah, they, they would be thrilled with how this has gone. Yep. Um, I'm going to surprise you with this pick. I think I know. Go ahead. You want to guess? Keon Coleman. Wrong. Ooh. I'm going to take Xavier Worthy. All right. To Buffalo here. Um, speed. Speed, the fastest. And we saw John Ross did not exactly uh, bathe himself in glory. After having the record time for 40s and guys like Darius Hayward Bay, who were just strict speed merchants, 
did not work out or pan out well. But um, I think he's more than just a straight line runner. He's obviously not the biggest receiver in the draft. But um, that is a scary. You have now. All right, Josh Allen. He can overthrow people. If there's, if you want to put together and see an interesting study here, like a sports science special, what's stronger, his arm or this guy's legs? I'd love to see what that looks like, man. That would be very, very, very entertaining. I These told, I told you when up. we did the, the pod two weeks ago, like mid rounds guy who could be an all pro. It's easier than ever to be an undersized receiver. Obviously saying someone's the next Tyree kill feels ridiculous, but he has, there is tape of Xavier worthy going over the middle, taking hits, keeping the ball landing and keeping going. It's not like he's just a little guy who gets knocked out every time he takes a hit. He's pretty tough and he's arguably the fastest player ever to come into the NFL. So I think that I think he's going to be a very, very exciting player. Uh, I don't I don't hate the pick at all. Now, this run of AFC teams continues with the Detroit Lions, Danny. Is that right? Yes. You said I was going to be doing a lot of work. Is that yeah? <laughs> pick 29 Detroit? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was looking at. Uh... I was looking at something that had a had a potential trade. I I, I apologize. <laughs> um, okay, they need defensive line help. They need they need defense. I will take uh, I'll take Newton from from Illinois. He's he's a little undersized, but he's a very productive player. He is everybody loves him and raves about him, his work ethic, his motor, all of that stuff. So I would say that he fits into what Dan Campbell wants and he could play next to Aiden Hutchinson and they will just say, thank you very much for giving us the second best interior defensive lineman in the draft of the 29th pick overall. And I happen to like that you were shamed by Brian Baldinger last week for not having... Uh, I don't know a ton about him. I didn't watch a ton of Illinois football, but, but I know, I know what the lions need. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I, I, I can't, I can't speak about the fighting line, but I can speak about the Detroit lions. So I think that this would be a pick for them. I think they would so, also consider Jared verse, by the way. So Baltimore is next and you know, they have a reputation for, you know, if somebody falls, who's should have been a top 20 or top 15 pick, they take the guy, you know, that's just kind of what they're known for. So I guess I could take verse here because they've got Owe at one spot, but they've got Ojabo also at outside linebacker who remember got hurt at his pro day at Michigan. And they expect him to have a much bigger role now going into this year. Um, their offensive line is not a strength of the team anymore. Uh, Stanley's hurt all the time. Their left guard is a seventh round pick. Linderbaum's a very good center. Their right tackle is Daniel Falal. I mean, this is a guy. So I think here, I'm going to take another offensive lineman. I'm going to give them Tyler Guyton with this pick. And I'm going to, I don't know. I might ask him to play right tackle, I guess, in this situation. Um, I think, think they about, could take. What about Jordan Morgan? Mm, I think he's a day two pick. I think they could take. I think they could take Frazier, and have him play guard, even though he's been a center. Yeah, I think he's it, being drafted as a center. But I think they're going to take an offensive lineman because it's just such a position of weakness right now, and take the best offensive tackle that's left out there, and rearrange the chess pieces or ask him to play right tackle, uh, like the Steelers did with Broderick Jones last year. So Tyler Guyton. Mm -hmm. All right. San Francisco. They don't need anything. But the right side of their offensive line was bad. It's getting a little old. So 
I could easily see what I just said about Jordan Morgan being there and saying wherever he needs to play, he plays and they just upgrade in that spot. But I got to say, man, draft like Matt Miller says that it was is six is the minimum and eight is the maximum for receivers in this draft. And we've got two picks left and we're at four. And obviously, I assume you will take a receiver with the, for the Chiefs pick at th- at at thirty two. But I just think this might be an embarrassment of Rich's spot for San Francisco. That instead of taking the tenth offensive lineman, they take the fifth wide receiver, and they would consider Lad McConkey, but ultimately go. They would consider Keon Coleman, but. Adonai Mitchell and his raw talent would just be the guy that they would say this can be this can be like the X factor type of player for their system. This is the ultimate, you know, no need luxury pick. I'll say Adonai Mitchell to the Niners. In that That's situation, my- in that situation, I want I think they trade Ayuk. Right, right, exactly, exactly, because they're not paying him so. So yes, agreed. It's it's it's. I should have mentioned that it's it's Brandon Ayuk insurance, absolutely. So I'm trying to think of who these receivers are that Matt is convinced are all first round picks because I'll, I'm going to take one for Kansas City here, given their drops problems. MVS got cut. I don't think got signed by anybody, right? I think he's still a free agent. Um, yeah. Sky Moore never developed. You know, Justin Watson's a great kid who might occasionally listen to this podcast. But, and he won't take any kind of, uh, he won't take offense to me saying this, but, you know, he knows he's not a number one receiver. So they need somebody there. And I think like Lad McConkey is an obvious pick because Andy Reid is going to be smiling ear to ear to ear because the dude just gets open. And so he'll fit him in there and they'll move him around and they'll play him inside and outside. And, you know, he'll be one of these guys that once Travis Kelsey retires could catch eight or nine balls a game. Um, So that's what I'm going to make my pick. But, you know, who are the other wide receivers that are going to be first round picks? Roman Wilson from Michigan? No. Ricky Pearsall from Florida? No. Like, I think we got the number about right here. I don't think we... Well, can you bet it, right? I mean, you obviously you can. What what's the over under? On wide receivers? Yeah, first round wide receivers. Let me see if I can pull it up real quick. Yeah, I like when we give people good betting advice on this show. Uh, God damn. There's a lot of bets you can make about this. What's wrong with that? No, nothing. Total, um, number, total number of receivers in the first round over under six and a half. The over is plus 182. See? Yeah, so maybe Matt Miller is very wrong. Um, if it's not McConkey, I think it'll be the kid from Oregon. That'll be the last word I have on this. I think Frank. Listen, Franklin. I, so the kid from Oregon is um Troy Franklin. Troy Franklin, yeah. Um they could listen. The, the Chiefs could just say, "We're taking an offensive lineman." There's nothing wrong with that. We're taking jo- we're corner. taking Jordan Morgan. We're protecting Mahomes. We're taking uh, Patrick Paul, that kid from Houston. <laughs> we're taking the kid from BYU. Like who whoever they have, they could take Kool Aid with this pick. Yeah. Uh, so you're taking McConkey. Yep, he'd be fun in that offense. All right, man. I have this written down. Spencer has it. Can we set an over-under on how many picks we actually nail? If I put it at five and a half. If we get five right, I'll be happy. You'll, get, you'll be happy. But I think we could get ten. And I want to tell people again, it's not gonna pipeline to the pros, folks. Thank you for the plugs. I very much appreciate it. Uh, We will talk to you next week. I will be in Detroit. Thank you to Spencer Ray. Tell a friend about my book. 
And if you mention the pod, that would be great. He's Andrew Filipponi. I'm Danny Parkins. First in pod. Peace.